Nissan One, the solar eclipse. Now I'm making this video for the non-Jewish people because I think there's a lot that the Gentiles, the non-Jewish, non-Hebrews need to know that we don't know. There is a lot to this coming full solar eclipse that God is talking to us right now. He really is, guys. He's talking to us right now on his appointed times. And what do we, again, non-Jewish, Gentile, Christians, true and faithful servants, what do we as a people not fully understand on God's calendar? God's calendar is Hebrew. <clears throat> it's not our pagan calendar. So non-Hebrews, um, we, we need to deepen. We need to deepen our understanding on God's appointed times and signs in his heavens. Because Jesus was super clear on this, the importance of God's feast. So today's video is really on that, the importance of God's feast. Now I have a lot, a lot, a lot of Bible verses I picked out for this. As you know, because of time, I can only read a few. I can only read a few, but get a pen and paper. Just know I'm gonna be giving you a whole bunch of Bible verses so you can do this study on your own. I've spent the entire day doing this study, but you guys can do this on your own. <clears throat> now let's talk about, oh boy, my voice is really going out. Let's talk about the importance of God's feast in Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. All right. Before we get started on Nissan 1, that begins April 9th, 2024. That is when the Jews know, Hebrew people know, to start cleaning their house because Passover is coming. Now, when we talk about cleaning your house, is that literal? Sure. All right. <clears throat> but you need to think about your house, your body. Does your body need some weeding? All right. Do we need to go through some of your daily thoughts and actions and kind of get them out of your life? So before I get started on the feast, I'm reminded as this sign the Lord is giving us on his high holy day was the war with Amalek. All right. So as we go through this, I want us to think about this. This is really important. Amalek. Now let's go to read, read all of Exodus 17. As you know, I'm going to pick on a few verses. But Exodus 17, I think there could be no better sign than where we are right now than what is said in Exodus 17. Now I'm going to read verses 14 uh, to 16. Exodus 17, 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this. For a memorial in a book. Now, if the Lord is telling Moses to write something in a book, that's how important it is. The Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. 
and Moses built an altar and called it the name of it Jehovah Nisi. I'm sure I said that wrong. I did my best. Verse 16. For he said, <clears throat> Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Wait, what? Come on now. Betsy, listen to this. We are in the last years of the generation that started when Israel became a nation. May 14, 1948. That was 76 years ago. Keep that in mind. Because in Psalms, we're told a generation is around 70-something years. And if it's a really strong generation, it's 80 years. All right, we're in the last four years of what can be called a generation. Because all that matters is Israel, Jerusalem, and the Jewish people. That's all that matters. Nothing else on planet Earth matters when it comes to God. And God said himself, he is going to have a war with Amalek from generation to generation. I mean, as we read this, keep that lens on. That's the lens we want to come at this video about. Why do we need to rehearse it in the ears of Joshua? Is that not setting an example? Remind each generation? So, another thing to think about here is that war that was started with Israel happened on the last day of a high holy day, the Feast of Tabernacles. If we don't understand the feast, we don't understand God's language. So that's why I'm making this, because non-Jews have no clue what the feasts are. I was surprised as I dug into this, and I've read it plenty of times before in the Jewish library, but I was surprised at the amount of scriptures that I found about this. It's really more important than I ever thought. I didn't know it. I'm putting this out there because maybe you don't know it either, and maybe one soul is saved because of it. <clears throat> None of this is a coincidence. What's going on right now, the solar eclipse that happened seven years ago that went from the northwest to the southeast, and the eclipse that's getting ready to happen here in just over 30 days, it's going from the southwest to the northeast. That's not an accident. That is the fingerprint of God. That is God's very finger itself over this country. I'll cover that at the end of the video. I hope my voice makes it. <clears throat> Hebrew calendar. Let's first talk about the Hebrew calendar. All right, for 2024. The Hebrew calendar for 2024 starts the first day, April 9, 2024. April 9. So all these days I'm going to give you is for the year 2024. And always feasts start the night before. So as I'm giving you these dates, just know feasts are always started in the evening before. Okay, I'll read that in Genesis 1 here in a moment. But let me first, uh, let's, let's talk about these feasts. There's seven of them. First one is Passover. April 22nd, observed the evening before. Next is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, April 23 to 29. Pentecost, June 16. Feast of Trumpets, October 3rd. Day of Atonement, October 12th. Feast of Tabernacles, October 17 to 23. And the eighth day is October 24. Like I said, all festivals... All feasts begin at sunset the evening before. Let's read that in Genesis 1-5. And you can also read it in Leviticus 23-32. I'll read Genesis 1-5. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Do you see that? The evening, then the morning was the first day. All right, let's talk about God's calendar and the feast. Down through history, disciples of Christ have celebrated seven biblical feasts. 
following the example and teaching of Jesus Christ and his apostles. The dates for these seven festivals are given in Leviticus 23. So read that. Just have your notes, Leviticus 23. The dates given in the Bible follow the Hebrew calendar. God's calendar is first mentioned in Genesis 1.14, where God appointed the sun and the moon to determine signs and seasons and days and years. If that weren't so, guys, how would we know, for example, how long Adam lived? How would we know that? The calendar started way back with Adam. We know how long Adam lived, and we know his genealogy. We know how many years everybody lived. That's how important this is, because God's timing and math is that important. There are so many uh, you know, chapters in the Bible to just the whole genealogy and how many years people live. It's for a reason. <clears throat> it's not just fluff thrown in. All right, so here, signs, season, days, and years. The Hebrew word translated seasons. The Hebrew word is moedim, which refers to appointed times. These appointed times are the feast listed in Leviticus 23. God created a complete calendar for humans in the beginning. Today, God's calendar is called the Hebrew calendar. It is used to determine the dates of God's annual holy days. Let me get some water. <clears throat> Many people have been taught that since Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, God's holy days have no value for Christians. That's, that's wrong. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I think that's why the Holy Spirit is giving me this assignment today of how important it is. All right, so the real meaning of these festivals was a mystery for the ancient Israelites. And the meaning remains hidden for today's Jews. And certainly for most of all Christians today. The meaning of these feasts can be understood Again, for me, with the help of the Holy Spirit. God's feasts reveal how God will save the world. These festivals were observed by Jesus and the early church. And they are still observed by those who follow Jesus today. Now, I started out the video with Matthew 5, 17 to 20, where Jesus is telling you about that. Now, in the two chapters later, Jesus says... For those, of the, for those who don't follow this, these festivals, it took on a whole new meaning. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Let's read that because it's scary stuff. To me, it's, it's some of the scariest verses in the Bible. Math, and I, I have it memorized. I know it very well. I think about it every single day. Matthew 7, let's read 21 to 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I don't think of myself as working iniquity. I don't think of myself as, you know, I don't cast out devils. I don't prophesy in the name. I would never do anything like that. But I, w I hate the thought. And again, the Holy Spirit gave this to me. So, so, you know, think twice about this. If we're not celebrating these feasts, is that going to be us in Matthew 7 that I just read? Will that be us? I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I, I can't make that call. But I can tell you about, I was shocked at how many scriptures I found on this. Shocking. And why did I never pick it up before? Because I didn't understand the festivals. I didn't understand the feast. And that's why I'm bringing this video to you today. So you can make a, you know, an informed decision on this for yourself. Let's go through the meaning of each of the feasts. As, as I, I condensed it down as much as I could, I'm going to be throwing out a whole lot of Bible verses now. 
So you can do your own study, make your own decision. And I'm just, I'm just laying, I'm just laying the groundwork for you guys to get together with your study groups and do a study on this, you know, a thorough, a very thorough study. The Passover is a memorial of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to pay for our sins, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It is celebrated after sunset at the beginning of the 14th day of the first month on the Hebrew calendar, Matthew 26, 19 to 30, Leviticus 23, 5. At the Passover service, members of God's church follow Christ's instructions to wash one another's feet, John 13, 14 to 17. They also eat a piece of, a piece of unleavened bread representing the broken body of Christ. They drink a small amount of wine, representing the blood of Jesus that paid for our sins. Matthew 26, 26 to 29. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. Leviticus 17, 11. I'm going to read that one. I'll read Le Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. I condensed that down as much, much as I could. Now, next is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It is a seven-day festival representing a Christian's journey out of sin. During this seven-day period, true Christians remove leaven, in other words, separating the yeast out of the bread, from their homes, and they eat unleavened bread instead. During this feast, leaven represents sin that followers of Christ must remove from their lives with the help of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul instructed non-Jewish members of the church to keep the feast of the unleavened bread, not with the old leaven, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let's read that in 1 Corinthians 5, 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The first and the last day of the feast are holy days. Leviticus 23, 7 to 8. This feast is also talked about in or mentioned in Acts 20, verse 6. On the Sunday, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, <clears throat> the Bible describes a wave sheaf ceremony. Read that, Leviticus 23, 9 to 14. This symbolic offering of the first grain of the spring harvest represents Jesus Christ, who was the first to rise from the dead to eternal life. It's also represented in the Virgin of the Maseroth sign Virgo. Um, the first to rise from the dead to eternal life. Read 1 Corinthians 15, 20-23. Just as a wave sheep was raised into the sky on a Sunday, Jesus rose to heaven on the Sunday after he was resurrected, John 20, 17. All right. Again, I'm just laying a groundwork so you guys can take this and do a thorough study of all of the Bible verses. Let's move on to the Feast of Pentecost. It is to be celebrated on the Sunday that comes 50 days after the wave sheaf is offered. Leviticus 23, 15 to 21. Acts to one on this day god gave the holy spirit to the disciples right acts 2 4 acts 38 2 38 to 41 the disciples continued to celebrate pentecost to remember the important event in god's plan acts 20 16 as well as first corinthians 16 8 let's read that but i will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. That was Paul. All right, moving on. The Feast of Trumpets represents 
the day of the Lord, a one-year period of judgment at the end of the age that Jesus describes in Revelation. Read that in Revelation 1.10, Revelation 8, 1-9, and Revelation 21. When the seventh trumpet is blown on the day of trumpets, Jesus will appear in the sky, and the followers of Christ will be resurrected from the dead and rise to meet him in the air. Revelation 11, 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, Matthew 24, 30 to 31. The Day of Atonement. So the Day of Atonement foreshadows the time when Satan, who deceives the whole world, Revelation 12, 9, will be locked up, Revelation 20, 1 to 3, Leviticus 16, 10. That's the one I'm going to read. Leviticus 16, 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. On this day, Christ's redeeming sacrifice and the Holy Spirit will be made available to all people. Joel 2.28, Zechariah 12, 10-13, Hebrews 8, 11, and 12. The Day of Atonement is also mentioned in Hebrews 9, 7. I'll read that one. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. And finally, in Acts 27, verse 9. Next, we have the Feast of the Tabernacles. It is a seven-day feast that represents the establishment of of the kingdom of God on earth and the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Revelation 20, verse 4, as well as 5, 10. Zechariah 14, 9. This kingdom is the gospel, good news, that Jesus came to announce. Mark 1, 14 to 15. The Bible says that eventually everyone in the world will keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So let's read that one. That's very important. So the Bible says that eventually everyone in the world will keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, we can read it in Zechariah 14, 16 to 19. All right, let's read that. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even... Go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. This shall be punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that, that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. Now, John 7 describes some of the things that Jesus did and taught while he kept the feast of the tabernacles. Now read all of John 7 on this. I can't read all of John 7, but I will read 14 to 17 because it's, I thought out of all of John 7, it was the most important. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, let's go to the last feast. The last feast of the year 
is celebrated immediately after a seven-day Feast of Tabernacles and is simply called the Eighth Day. This represents the time beyond the 1,000-year reign of Christ, when all people who have lived will be resurrected and judged. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, and whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no and there was found no place for them. Revelation 22 verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. All right. During the judgment period, those who never heard about Jesus Christ and those who heard but did not understand because God has not called them yet, right? Matthew 13, 10 to 15, Matthew 19, John 6, 4, 4, Acts 2, 39 will be resurrected to physical life and given their first opportunity for salvation. Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. Please read that. Matthew eleven twenty one to 24. Matthew 12, 41 to 42. John 8, 1 to 10. Describes what Jesus did and taught on this holy day. Just as Jesus opened the eyes of the blind and forgave a woman who was caught in sin, Jesus will open the eyes of all people and forgive those who are willing to repent of their sins during the judgment period. This is like the best news I've heard all day. I can't even tell you how happy I am about this. All right, so <clears throat> let's read that. John 7, 37 to 39. All right, John 7, 37 and 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. You can also read John 3, 16. You should know that one by heart. And Hebrews 9, 27. Now I'm going to end that one right here with 2 Peter 3, 9. Let's read that. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In the Hebrew calendar, months follow the cycle of the moon. Years follow the cycle of the sun. Each month begins with a new moon. Since the lunar year is about 11 days shorter than the solar year, an extra month is added seven times every 19 years. This is why the angels love the number 19 so much. Uh, do a study on, <laughs> on the 19-year cycle with the fallen angels. Anyway, so while most years have 12 months, some years have 13 months. From ancient time, the dates of the new moons and the years, which extra months must be added, have been calculated in advance so that everyone in the world can observe God's festivals at the same time without confusion. This is fascinating, guys. I, I hope this is I hope this is helping you. I hope this is giving you an aha moment. I mean, this is so important to know this information. God wants everyone in, on planet Earth to be celebrating his festivals at the same time without confusion. Let's read 1 Corinthians 14:33. All right, 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now skip down to the last verse, 
of 1 Corinthians 14 and read verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. That was an aha moment for me. I hope it was for you. But anyways, moving on. The religious year begins with the month of Ib. Exodus 12, 2. Exodus 13, 4. Exodus 23, 15. This month is also called Nisan. Esther 3, 7. Let's read that. In the first month, that is, the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Hazorus, they cast Pur, that is, the lot before Hammon, from day to day, and from month to month, and to the twelfth month, that is, the month Adar. All right. <clears throat> so the agricultural and silver year, civil year, begins and ends in the seventh month. Levit Leviticus 25, 8 to 9. This is why Jews call the first day of the seventh month of the new year Rosh Hashanah. The first day of the seventh month is also the Feast of Trumpets. Now, in the Hebrew calendar, each day begins and ends at sunset. Again, I already read that with Genesis 1, 5. Also Leviticus 23, 32. So the Sabbath and the holy days begin at sunset on the day before the date given on the Roman pagan calendar. So, again, 2024, Hebrew calendar, the first month, Nisan, is 9 April to 8 May. The second monthly year is 9 May, 6 June. Third month, Sivun, is 7 June, 6 July. The fourth month, Tammuz, is 7 July to 4 August. Fifth month, Av, is 5 August to 3 September. The sixth month, Elul, 4 September to 2nd October. Seventh month Tishri, 3 October to 1 November. Eighth month Heshvan, 2nd November, 1 December. Ninth month Kislev, 2nd December to 31 December. Tenth month Tebet, 1st January to 29 January 2025. Eleventh month Shavat, 30 January 28 February 2025 and the 12th month Adar 1st March to 29th March 2025 this is my conclusion now you're just getting what I was thinking as I now finished this study what I can say is that the very least God will have a say on this country this year in whatever way I was told back a few months ago, America is Nineveh. And will the collective of the actual real residents here, people born here, will they repent? I mean, does God even exist any longer in this country? Will his judgment come to this land? All I know is through the sun and the moon over the past seven years, seven years has left a marking of the Hebrew letter Aleph and Tav. Aleph and Tav means Alpha and Omega. Are we the harlot? For when did the finger of God make a pronouncement? Right away, for me, I know to go to Daniel 5. I love Daniel 5 so much. I've read it so many times. But here, at the end of this study, this is what I'm thinking. God, through the sun and the moon, left a marking over this country, left a pathway over this country, left a Hebrew letter, identical Hebrew letters of Aleph and Tav. He left them on this country in the last seven years. And, of course, Daniel 5. I'm going to read almost all of Daniel 5. I'll start in verse 3. It's so important. It's how important this is. All right, Daniel 5, 3 to 31. And as I'm reading it, think America here. This is about the king, Nebuchadnezzar's son. And what happened when he is with what America worships today, all of his psychics, his mediums, and his astrologers. And they're, and they're celebrating their little G gods. 
Because in Daniel 5, when I say the word God, it's little g most of the time, except when that, that writing on the wall comes. That's, you know, this is where we get the saying, the writing on the wall, is Daniel 5. That's a biblical meaning, the writing on the wall. Well, God's finger wrote on this land, United States. God's finger left a mark. All right, Daniel 5, verse 3 to 31. Then they bought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princess, his wife and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods, little g, of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, that would be the prophets, the soothsayers. The king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed was scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck. He shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king, and his lords came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, King, live forever and ever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like wisdom of the gods, was found in him. Whom King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the king, I say thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, showing of hard sentences, dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art the children of captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in you. And now the wise men, the astrologers have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee, thou canst make interpretation and dissolve doubts. Now, if thou can read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, Thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. That should be an example to everybody who's offered something. Do what Daniel did. No, 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 no. I don't want your money. I don't want your scarlet robes. I don't want to be you know, third ruler in the kingdom. Nope, but let me tell you what my God says about this. I love that. O thou, King Most High God, gave kept Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, a majesty, and a glory and honor. And the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages, trembled and feared before him, who he would slew, and whom he would be kept alive, and whom he would set up, and whom he would put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed, from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. He was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled, rode over the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. He's talking all about Nebuchadnezzar there. Nebuchadnezzar became a Nephilim. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knowest all of this. So everything Daniel just told him, his son watched. 
His son watched Nebuchadnezzar, his own dad, become a Nephilim, a wild oxen eating grass. He watched him transform into a non-human wild beast. He watched him transform. But yet, he still cares. I mean, the pride and the arrogance is unbelievable. But I'm, I'm telling you, look at Daniel 5 through the United States of America lens. I mean, keep that in mind. You're a resident here. Your home is here. Look at America as a whole of what's going on here. Verse 23. But hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven? And they have brought the vessels of this house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, thy concubines have drunk wine in them. You has prayed the gods of silver and of gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose all, whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written, and this is the writing that was written, many, many tekel of Shushan. This is the interpretation of the thing, many. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Let's finish this out. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night, that very night, in that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. Isaiah prophesied that would come. When was the next time? When was the next time that literally the finger of God wrote? Was it not the harlot? Remember the harlot? I'm just asking you, is the harlot America? Remember the harlot that was brought to him? Right? Was The harlot was brought to be stoned to Jesus to make a, you know, to... to Decide on the fate of the harlot. Let's read that in John 8, 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Is that not a prophecy? Because on this land in America, God's finger has laid a path, and that path is the Alpha and Omega, the Aleph and the Tav, in God's alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. All I can say is I hope this saves one soul out there, potter out.